Welcome back to Pentagram Prime, everyone. Today, we will be looking at the real improper integral of sine squared x over x squared from 0 to infinity. Specifically, we're here to prove that it is equal to pi over 2. Well, we'll kind of prove it. The process is actually more nuanced than that. This video ended up being a little bit longer than previously expected. Timestamps for the various sections are listed in the description. Exercise 2 on page 301 of Marston and Hoffman asks us to do this and includes a hint suggesting consideration of an alternate complex integral and use of proposition 4311. An entire video could be made about Prop 4311, shown on page 286, and while I won't go that far, I will attempt a brief description here of both it and the formula for principal value of an improper integral in the complex plane. The Cauchy principal value, denoted by PV, indicates an alternate method of evaluating the individual limits of an improper integral. This method involves some additional symmetry specific to how those limits are evaluated. The first and second terms on the right side of the equation apply to residues in the upper half of the complex plane, not including the real axes, and to residues located on the real axes, respectively. For example, the improper integral 1 over x cubed from minus to positive infinity, shown on page 283, does not converge. But if we choose to evaluate the limit at x equals 0 in a symmetric fashion, then it does. But as we see on page 284, if you evaluate the limit in an asymmetric fashion, then the integral remains undefined. The important thing to realize about Cauchy principal value is that it can result in a finite value for an otherwise undefined integral. So don't be fooled into thinking that the integral converges when it doesn't. Wolfram Alpha will tell you the same thing. Unlike, for example, 1 over x cubed, if that improper integral happens to be defined, then the Cauchy principal value will tell us what it is equal to. In the case of proposition 4311, if the integrand f meets certain requirements, then the principal value exists and can be calculated using a formula based on residues of singularities of f in the complex plane. For our purposes in exercise number two, we will be using option one of proposition 4311, which is based on proposition 436. What is 436? I'm very glad that you stayed awake long enough to ask that question. Proposition 436 on pages 275 and 276 is a method for evaluating the real improper integral of a function f by treating f as a function of z in a given half of the complex plane and using the residues of f as a means of obtaining the value of the aforementioned real integral. The number of singularities in the half plane being used must be finite and Prop 436 forbids the existence of singularities on the real axes. In part 1 of Proposition 4311, the requirements are the same as Proposition 436, except that the singularities on the real axes are now allowed. This is good for us because in Exercise 2, we're being asked to consider this complex integral on the real axes before applying Proposition 4311. If you look carefully at the requirements for Prop 436 and Prop 4311, you'll find that 1 minus e to the 2ix over x squared is in accordance with these requirements. The book gives us the hall pass as far as justification for use of Proposition 4311 in Exercise 2, but I'm going to try to rigorously justify it anyway. Those of you not interested in how we justify use of Prop 4311 may skip to its application. There should be a link in the description. I should also mention that I never attempted this problem when I took complex analysis, and I have yet to meet a living soul who dealt with it or the specific justifications for use of the aforementioned mathematical tools. This video is as off the cuff as it gets on this channel. As I've said in the past, I hope my videos do enough good to justify their existence, and to that end, I need to be upfront about my experience or lack thereof. But I still want to take a swing at analyzing the requirements placed upon the aforementioned integral by the tools being used to analyze it. Part 1 of Proposition 436 asks us to consider the three positive real variables m, p, and r0. All of this relates to the absolute value of f of z for a given absolute value of z greater than or equal to r0. For every value of z whose absolute value is greater than or equal to r0 on an open set containing the upper half of the complex plane, there needs to exist a corresponding f of z 
whose absolute value is less than or equal to a given m over absolute value of z to the power of p. The variables m, p, and r0 are permitted to vary depending upon the value of z. You do not necessarily need to look for values of m, p, and r0 that satisfy the entire open set of z values described in part 1 of Proposition 436. So don't be like me. Don't spend three days chasing something that doesn't exist while second-guessing yourself. For f of x equals 1 minus e to the 2yx over x squared, we need to take a moment to substitute z in for x and evaluate the absolute value of f of z. Breaking down e to the 2yz using Euler's relation gives us the individual sine and cosine functions with two angles each per the definition of z in terms of x and y in the complex plane. We next use double angle identities to expand the sine and cosine functions before employing hyperbolic identities to deal with the imaginary components inside of the trigonometric arguments. A little bit of consolidation and housekeeping ahead of calculating the absolute value by squaring the real and imaginary components and voila! You now have an expression for the absolute value of f of z that roughly fits the form of the inequality in Proposition 436. P obviously equals 2 in this case. If we add a 1 inside of the radical, then we are afforded the right to use an inequality. But the plus 1 inside of the radical only indicates that the expression on the right is greater than the absolute value of f of z and not greater than or equal to as in the text. However, the fact that there exists an expression in the numerator that is both finite, real, and satisfies the condition of the right side being greater than the absolute value of f of z indicates that there also exists possible values of m for each point in the complex plane for an absolute value of z greater than or equal to r0 such that m divided by the absolute value of z squared can be either equal to or greater than the absolute value of f of z. The inequality for the absolute value of f of z is valid specifically for the case where the absolute value of z is greater than or equal to a certain positive minimum value r0. For our purposes, an absolute value of z greater than or equal to an r0 value of 1 satisfies this condition in Proposition 436, and with the requirements of Proposition 436 satisfied, we can justify the use of Part 1 of Proposition 4311. I would like to pause and reiterate that Proposition 436, in our case Part 1, does not allow for singularities on the real axes, but that part one of proposition 4311 does and utilizes the same requirements as 436 otherwise. And I'd also like to hear from someone who's analyzed the same arguments that I just went over. Pentagram prime will probably never be good enough for peer review, but at least we're not arguing that the Earth is flat or that Crimea voted Vladimir Putin a likable guy. So, having justified its use, we can now focus on the formula for principal value itself as laid out in Proposition 4311. Let us recap what the two terms on the right are for. The first applies to singularities in the upper half of the complex plane that do not fall on the real axes, and the second term only applies to residues on the real axes itself. Now, the formula f of z has just one lonely singularity at z equals nothing, located on the real axes, which of course includes the origin. Thus, the first term disappears because there are no singularities slash residues anywhere except for the one at the origin. We are then left with pi i times the sum of the residues on the real axes, and since there is only one residue located on the real axes, we can lose the summation and just call it pi i times the residue of f at x, or z if you prefer, equals zero. All that is left now is calculation of the residue. If your function happens to have zeros in both the numerator and denominator, then a good first line of attack in residue calculation is frequently to label the top and bottom portions as g and h respectively. So for our purposes, the function g of z is 1 minus e to the 2iz, and h of z is equal to z squared.
Next, we evaluate g and h at z equals 0 and do the same for their respective first derivatives and all higher derivatives until we obtain non-zero values for each function at the origin. If you have watched my previous videos related to residue theory, well, they will not help you here. Today we will be using a new trick in the form of Proposition 413 on page 245. Requirements for Prop 413 start off with the order of the zero of the function g of z. In this case, it can be shown to be of the first order by virtue of the fact that its first derivative evaluated at z equals nothing is of a non-zero value. This gives us a value of k equals 1, and we must next look at the behavior of h of z. The function h has a second order zero at the origin, as evidenced by the fact that its lowest order non-zero derivative is that of the second. A second order derivative is the same as taking a k plus one order derivative for a value of k equals one, and this matches the proposition for one three requirements for k. Thus, the functions g and h match the requirements for use of proposition for one three. So we can use the listed formula for calculation of the residue of f at the origin. Inserting k equals 1 along with the values of g prime and h double prime evaluated at z naught equals 0 gives us minus 2i for the residue of f at 0. Returning to the Prop 4311 formula for principal value, consolidating some i's and some minus signs, and we get 2 pi for the principal value of the integral of 1 minus e to the 2iz over z squared from minus to positive infinity. Time for another headache, at least for me, because as someone who likes to do math on YouTube, I also like to be right. And it's important to be right when it comes to math. Otherwise, what are we doing here? So I should be clear on any points that I'm not absolutely sure of. And unfortunately, I was unable to rigorously verify whether or not the principal value exhibits a distributive property. I'm guessing that it does, but I haven't proven it, and I did not want to uh, say so if I didn't have a source indicating as such. So, you've all been warned. In case it wasn't obvious what I was talking about, let us assume that f of z is equal to the sum of two functions. In this case, theta of z plus lambda of z. If principal value exhibits a distributive property, then we should be able to separate the principal value of the integral of f of z into separate principal values of the integrals of theta and lambda. This assumption will be the basis for the rest of the work in this episode, along with another assumption that we'll get to later. Those of you busily copying this all down for a homework assignment, well, I'll say again, you've been warned. I mentioned distributed property because we're about to break this integral into pieces. Euler's relation allows us to expand e to the 2yz into cosine of 2z plus i sine of 2z. Taking the principal value of the expanded version of f of z on the right, we now have the opportunity to separate the integral into two parts. This allows us to break the original principal value into real and imaginary components. Taking another look at what we calculated earlier for the original principal value, we can see that there is no imaginary component. Thus, we can show that the second principal value on the right is 0, and the real component equals 2 pi. If you have any reservations about the imaginary component of the original principal value, then Wolfram Alpha is your friend and it seems to confirm our results. As for the real component, if we factor out a 2, we now have a trigonometric identity for sine squared of z. And here we run headlong into another sadly necessary assumption. The text on page 284 states that if the improper integral is convergent, aside from many considerations regarding Cauchy principal value, then the principal value will give us the same value as that of the improper integral itself. We have not shown here that the improper integral of sine squared of z over z squared from minus infinity to positive infinity is convergent. Ditto for its real counterpart using x. And my HR manager is telling me that I'm way over hours for this video, so it will need to come to its bitter end. And to be clear, we will not be proving the convergence of sine squared x over x squared dx from minus infinity to positive infinity, at least not this episode. We will simply be verifying the predicted value given in the text of exercise number two. If you feel the need, a 30 second Google search will lead you to some resources on how the convergence of this 
and the improper integral for the entire x-axis can be demonstrated. Thus, if we assume that the integral of sine squared of x over x squared from minus infinity to positive infinity and its complex counterpart based on z is convergent, then we can say that it is equal to the relevant principal value. With that caveat in place, we can say that the principal value of the integral of 1 minus cosine of 2z over z squared dz from minus infinity to plus infinity equals 2 times the integral of sine squared x over x squared dx from minus infinity to positive infinity using the aforementioned figure of 2 pi that we already calculated for the relevant principal value, we now have an expression for the value of the improper integral sine squared x over x squared dx from negative to positive infinity. Twos drop out, and I'm going to pause again to remind everyone that this all hinges on the assumption illustrated in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, as well as one other before that about distributed properties and principal value. It's possible there is some other clue in the text that negates the need for these assumptions, but I didn't see one. I've been told they make an excellent punching bag. Please let me know if I'm wrong. So, we're nearly there, but the bounds of integration are not what we came here for. Luckily, sine squared x over x squared is an even function, and the integral can be seen graphically to be the same when taken on the left or the right-hand side of the origin. Thus, the integral of the function sine squared x over x squared from 0 to positive infinity is twice that of the integral from negative to positive infinity, and as we inch towards our answer, I will say that everything we are doing hinges on that thing in the upper left-hand corner being true, as well as this thing. Divide both sides by 2, and we're golden, I guess. Can you really use QED if you have a gaping hole in your proof? Wish I could say. If you are out there and you've worked this problem, then I would love to hear from you. So, these are my handwritten notes. Not much to see here, roughly two pages, and a lot of that is just me rehashing the text of the problem itself, along with some other stuff that I included for my own nefarious purposes. The problem only took about an evening's worth of real full-time effort, and most of the issues that came up in this video were from a realization afterwards, as I was writing the script, that I had made multiple assumptions about things that I could not safely claim to be true. So if anyone's wondering why the audio and editing is a little less than polished, that's why. Till next time, this is Pentagram Prime signing off.